right, we love Jesus, we love the Bible. The Bible is about Him. If you're a guest with us, this is what we do. We preach through books of the Bible, going verse by verse. And so we are in the great book of Judges. We've been in Judges for quite some time. We're in Judges chapter 15 today. We're continuing looking at this man named Samson. If you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. One of our ushers will bring you one. If you don't own one, this is our gift to you. But as the, they pass out Bibles, I'll just give you a little introduction into Samson's life. If you remember, uh, he, was, he was born uh, the first week. He had godly parents. They were going to ra- raise him in the ways of the Lord. The second week, last week, we saw that Samson, uh, he only does what is right. He feels is right in his own eyes. The first thing he did uh, was to find a woman that he was forbidden to marry and marry her. That was the first thing he wanted to do. And so this is kind of Samson begins to embody uh, God's people. And so God's people are to be set apart, uh, wholly set apart to him to worship him alone. Samson is under this vow called the Nazarite vow, and he's supposed to be wholly set apart to God. Uh, God's people, though they're, they're set apart, don't honor him. They don't worship him. They've rebelled against him. They're in a state of apostasy. Samson, what he is doing is he continues to rebel against the the, the God of the Bible, and he has no regard for his Nazarite vow. The three things in the vow that he's not supposed to do is drink wine. He drinks wine last week. He's not supposed to be around dead body, so uh, he killed a lion with his bare hands, and he ate the honey after bees came afterwards and made a a, a nest and had some, I don't know if they make nests, you know, Fact check that later, but there was there was honey there, and he he ate he ate out of a out of a carcass. Not supposed to do that. Uh, the third thing is cut his hair. He's he's he, up to this point he's kept his hair intact. That's the only thing he's done. Uh, but what we will see today is that he continues to do what's right in his own eyes. And again, this is an embodiment of Israel themselves. The culture around the 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 people of God in the Book of Judges is that God's people are worshiping the same gods of the, as the culture around them. And so instead of choosing God's word. His will and ways, uh, what brings God the most glory, they choose to do what they feel is right in their own eyes. What they want, what they think, what feels right to them, it's their truth, their reality. Sound familiar? All right. Uh, Because we are living similarly in the book of Judges in our day and our age. And so, what we do, what we see here is Samson is going to continue that pattern here um, in the beginning of Judges chapter 15. And so, after some days, at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson went to visit his wife with a young goat. Now, real quick, uh, last week, Samson got married uh, to a woman that, that he was not supposed to marry, but he married her anyways. Uh, and, and in doing so, uh, what happened at the wedding feast, he got into some gambling debt. Crazy. Uh, he's in gambling debt. In order to pay off his gambling debt, he goes and murders 30 guys uh, to pay off his debt. And in doing so, uh, throughout the, 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 the scene, he, he's, he's in, his wife's betrayed him. His friends have betrayed him. He's just in, he's in hot anger, the text says. And he uh, leaves the marriage, leads, leaves the wedding, le- you know, leaves his wedding night and goes back home to live with his father and mother. Um, and then after some days, what we see here, so after a couple days, his anger has subsided. He's going to go back to visit his wife, and he brings a young goat. This is the uh, ancient uh, flowers. Ladies, so if your husband shows up with a young goat, just know he might have been reading Judges 15, chapter 1. You know, he's like, hey, I got an idea. Uh, uh, Men, just get flowers, not goats. Uh, Whatever, do what you want to do. Whatever's right in your own eyes, right? Um, And he said, I will go into my wife in the chamber. He wants to uh, kiss and make up, so to speak. That's what he's ready to do. Uh, But his father... Sorry, but her father, so his father-in-law, would not allow him to go in. And her father said, I really thought you utterly hated her, so I gave her to your companion. So I thought you didn't like her, so she married another guy in the meantime while you were gone. That's your wedding that you paid for. (laughs) She got married to another guy. So then he goes, let's make up for this. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please take her instead. What a father-in-law, right? Not, he's, yeah, he's not the greatest guy. Uh, just imagine that being your dad. Like, hey, you know, I, I don't care who you marry. Uh, the highest bidder and then, hey, sister, your sister, you know, your, your seconds. Like, that's, that's how he is. But she's more beautiful. This is the perverted logic of, the, of the, 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 the Philistine culture, but more over the day and age in which they find themselves in judges. Things don't make sense. Relationships, they don't make sense. And so while Samson left the wedding in hot anger, the father-in-law said, hey, I got a good idea. Why don't we just keep it, let's keep the marriage going. Let's just 
hey, honey, you want another guy? Here's his best man. Last chapter we saw, literally, his best man in his wedding marries his wife while he's gone. And, and, and now Samson shows up to try to make up for his, his, his anger. He's ready to apologize. He's bringing a young goat. And he's like, I want to be with my wife. Um, and the father-in-law is like, hold up, hold up. You can't because she's not your wife anymore. Uh, she actually has another husband who was your best friend. That's the scene we find ourselves in. And so for a moment, let's pause and let's remember a little bit about what we saw last week in Judges chapter 14. Um, Samson, there went into great detail, uh, the, the author of the book of Judges, went into great detail last week, reminding us multiple times that Samson picked this one woman, the Philistine woman, on purpose. He kept saying, no, I want her. She's right in my own eyes. Was she forbidden by God? Yeah. But still, he wanted that Philistine woman, not any Philistine woman. He wanted a particular woman, the woman he married. So it's important for us to see when the father-in-law is saying, hey, well, you know what? Why not just her sister? Samson's not okay with that because he's not simply just trying to get as many women as possible. Though it sometimes seems that that's what he's trying to do. He actually loves a particular woman, a forbidden woman, but a particular woman. And he does love her. And, and he, he at least wants to maintain his end of the covenant of marriage. Though she hasn't, uh, sh- he still wants to. And so Samson actually is very particular about he, what he wants. It may be he's only concerned about what he wants. He doesn't care about what God wants. He only cares about what he wants. But the point is he knows what he wants. He wants. And so two things we see in the life of Samson that he really doesn't want God's advice in. Number one, it's women. And number two is his Nazarite vow. He doesn't really want God's advice in his relationships and or his uh, personal holiness. If you're a Christian, you're like, well, it kind of seems like the whole thing. You're right. It is. That's pretty much most of his life. But we're going to see later that, that Samson actually does have a relationship with God. So towards the end of the sermon today, we're going to get into the details of his relationship with God. And I, I believe it will encourage us. But right now, he wants a particular woman who is his wife. He can't because she's been married to another man now. And he, he, he also only wants to do what's right in his own eyes. So meaning he wants to do what he wants when he wants to do it. Um, he doesn't, he doesn't want to do what God wants him to do uh, when God wants him to do it. See what I'm saying? He only wants to do what he wants to do when he wants to do it. And so what about you? Let me ask you this. Samson has two areas of his life where he doesn't want God's advice. Women and, his personal, and, and some personal things and, and, and his Nazarite vow. He doesn't want God's involvement in these two arenas or domains of his life. Are there any areas of your life where you're like, I actually don't want God's advice in? I actually read the word of God. I know what it says here. Here's a theological position that, that scares me a little bit, and I know what the Bible says on it, but I don't want to admit that I agree to it or believe in it or, or whatever because that seems narrow-minded, bigoted in our day and age. I, just want, I don't, I don't want to talk about it. I won't look at it. I won't remember it. I won't think about it. Uh, I know what God's Word says about this particular issue in a relationship, but hey, I don't, I don't want God getting involved in this part of my life. Are there parts of your life where you're like, I, you know, I know what God's Word says, but I just don't care about following him in this part of my life. Now, all these other areas, I'm willing. Like Samson knows what God says about his Nazarite vow, because God gave him the vow. Like God gave it to him. He doesn't have regard for God's word in regards to his personal holiness. Moreover, he doesn't have regard for what God's will is in his relationships. What about you? Are there areas of your life where you don't want God involved in? You, you, you try to compartmentalize your life in such a way where it's like, I can be a Christian in all these areas, but these two areas, one or two areas, you know, these are my areas. I want to warn you, I want to encourage you and warn you. This type of compartmentalization actually ruins Samson's life. God owns all the domains of your life. God actually owns the domains of his life, Samson's life that Samson's unwilling to give to God. Not that God can't take them. He already owns them, so he does not need to seize them from him. It's just Samson won't acknowledge God's authority in regards to his, his, his relationships with women and, and his uh, view of this vow that God has given him. I want to encourage you. Do not compartmentalize your Christianity. Christianity is, 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 we, is about worshiping Jesus the Christ, at every sphere and every domain of your life. That's what it means. That's what Christianity is about. It's about worshiping Jesus with our entire life. This is what Samson is called to, but there's a few areas yet in his life that he has, he's, he's, he's reserved for himself to continue to do what's right in his own eyes, and he hasn't given them to the Lord God. 
If that's you, give those areas to God. He already owns them. It'll be better off for you anyway. Let's continue. Samson obviously is upset, right? His wife has just been given away to another man who was his best man, so former friend. Uh, Verse 3, and Samson said to them, this time I shall be innocent in regard to the Philistines when I do them harm. A few things here. Number one, Samson admits he's going to do harm to somebody. (laughs) Number two, he admits that he has done harm to them in the past. Number three, he admits the last time probably wasn't justified. Number four, he says this time it will be. Last time it was to pay off his gambling debt. He murdered 30 people. He's like, ah, that was about it. That, my bad. That's, he's, he's admitting, you know, overstepped that one. This time when I harm them, it'll be, it'll be worth it. We'll be good. This is what we see with Samson. So, verse 4, so Samson went and caught 30 foxes, nice, cool feet, and took torches and, and turned them uh, tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of tails. And when the, he had set fire to the torches, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and set fire to the stacks of grain and to the standing grain, um, as well as to the uh, olive orchards. Samson has made a plan. His plan to get back justice in his mind to his father-in-law is to attack the government, the Philistines. The Philistines who rule over Israel and who are oppressing them. He says, I'm going to get back at my father-in-law, and so I'm going to burn down all the Philistines' uh, livelihood. I'm going to ruin their crops and ruin their food. If you remember back in verse 1, it says that uh, it was the, uh, uh, after some days, it was the time of the wheat harvest. This is time where they're harvesting their food. They finally got, they're prepared for this season of, 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 of food and crops, and Samson's like, I'm going to burn it all. What we see is Samson's very, very impulsive. He's also very passionate. He tends to be the guy who's, uh, who follows his passions. His passions are just wrong. His passion is to just go wild and crazy and to now get back at his father-in-law by destroying the nation, which is really wild, right? It wasn't the Philistines who, who gave his wife to another man. It was his father-in-law. His beef is really with his father-in-law and with his wife who was complicit adulterer, right? That's that's where his anger should be. But Samson knows that he's been called by God to deliver God's people from the oppressive hand of the Philistines. And so what Samson does, because he's not clued in and, and tied into God's word and God's plan, he's just going, you know what? This new opportunity to pick a fight with the Philistines. God told me I'm supposed to fight the Philistines. I don't care how I'm supposed, I'm not listening to him on his strategy and his war plan like God gave Gideon. I'm just going to do whatever I think is right in my own eyes. So my father-in-law, he uh, acted unjustly towards me. So now I'm going to take down the government. This is wildly impulsive. He, Samson is going to be used by God to deliver his people, God's people from the hands of the Philistines. But not because Samson follows the Lord's plans, actually. He actually does the opposite of of anything that seems to seek the Lord's uh, wisdom and vision in in regards to working out this plan in in the delivery of the uh, hand of, uh, delivering his people from the hands of the Philistines. So his his plan, doing what he's going to, I'm going to fulfill God's mission my own way. Have you been there? I just want to just, have you been there? You know what God's mission is? You're like, but I want to do it my way. It's how God says I should, uh, how we should care for the, the, uh, those, you know, that we dislike. He says, love your enemy, and like, eh, kind of I want to burn their, their grave. You know, eh, this is what God says about how I should treat people who disrespect me. Uh, well, I have another way of doing it. Christians, we are submitted not to the cultural, uh, the culture of our day, to do what everyone else is doing, but to submit to the word of God, to not to reject what we feel is right in our own eyes and fall in line with what God says uh, and what God commands us to do. Samson takes out his anger on his father-in-law and he he takes it out on the, the Philistine nation as a whole. In a weird way, he thinks that he's, he's playing a part of the mission. Ultimately, God will use this, but it will be at the cost of, of much of Samson's life, much of the good that could be in Samson's life. So next, what rightly happens is the Philistines respond. 
right? You would respond. Uh, they, they respond. The Philistines said, who has done this? And they said, Samson, the, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. So Samson, the, the, the Philistines now hear, okay, why does Samson just burn all of our crops? Well, it's because this Timnite dealt treacherously with Samson. And so now the, the, what we're going to see now with the Philistines, they're going to do what they think is right in their own eyes as well. This is what everyone's doing, what they think is right. So the Philistines, their livelihood has been trashed because of the adultery of Samson's wife and the suggestion of it by the father-in-law. And so the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. Hey, our crops just got destroyed by fire because you... Samson, I don't know why he went after us, but he went out instead of you. Since he didn't go after you, the Philistines are like, we are, going, we are going to charge you and condemn you. And since they burned our crops, we're going to burn your bodies. That's what they do. I'm not saying this is right, but I'm saying this is Philistine justice. This is the culture where everyone is doing what they feel is right in their own eyes, and it's leading to anarchy and chaos. Now, Samson is upset. Now, Samson gets back involved. Because what did they do? They just murdered his wife. So he's like, I know she was with another man, but I still loved her. And you took her out. Now I want to fight again. Verse 7. And Samson said to them, if this is what you do, I swear I will avenge, I will be avenged on you. And after that, I will quit. He's like, all right. I'm going to sin a little bit, and then I'll stop. You ever been there? <laughs> I'm going to sin a little bit, and I'm going to stop. This is wild, Samson. I'm going to have vengeance, which is not mine, which is the Lord's. I'm going to do a little vengeance for a little while. Have you ever been there? I'm going to do a little season of anger. I'm going to do a little season of bitterness. I'm going to get a little productive here, uh, uh, you know, doing things the world's way, and then I'll come back to the Lord. I'll, I'll quit after this. I'll just, I'll just come back to God later. This is what Samson is claiming he wants to do. What I want us to see Samson here, this impulsive behavior, he's, he's, he wants to do, again, what is right in his own eyes, no regard for the word of the Lord. And the reason why we know this is because the word of the Lord says that vengeance is not Samson's, but the Lord. Vengeance is not Samson's, it's the Lord. And oftentimes, what I, I, you, you kind of see vengeance, actually, we love vengeance uh, as a people. Our movies are vengeance, oftentimes. You're like, that was a really good movie. Why? Well, because some guy enacted, you know, vengeance. And you're like, yeah, he's the hero. Just be careful what you celebrate. I'm, I'm almost positive most movies we watch are, 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 are vengeance is the driving motive or bitterness or anger or some sort of sinful behavior is the motive for being some, accomplishing some quote-unquote good, right? And I say this often, that, that, that anger um, and bitterness and even vengeance, and these are productive emotions, they're productive. They get stuff done. You ever been really angry or bitter at someone and you got something done? You're like, yeah, man, I'm really good at emails when I'm angry. People don't like my emails when I'm angry, but I'm good at writing them because like, I have focus. I know what I want to say. Like, your, 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 your senses are heightened. I'm really good at arguing when I'm angry because, you know, <laughs> I, I, I win them often when I'm angry. When I'm not angry, I lose the arguments often. See, our, our sinful anger, our, our sinful vengeance, our, our bitterness, when it rules over us, it can be productive and get stuff done. Samson is getting stuff done for the mission, but not getting stuff done for the mission God's way. God's call on Samson's life is to deliver his people from the hands of the Philistines, and it's happening. But God's plan for, for Samson was not for vengeance. It's not for vengeance. And so in this, this spirit of vengeance, Samson breaks out into this fight in verse 8. And they struck them, or, and he struck them hip, hip and thigh with a great blow. Big old wrestling match, brawl broke out. Samson wins the fight, and he went down and stayed in the cleft of the rock at Edom. A couple of things, one thing to note, I just, I just saw this and was reminded of this. The Holy Spirit didn't empower him to win that fight. Later we see the Holy Spirit coming up on Samson and he wins military victories. Right here, the Spirit of God isn't blessing this, but Samson is still a good fighter. He still wins. He's still in his angry vengeance. It's is productive. You see how this can be confusing for Samson? In his anger and his vengeance, he's still productive. See, our motives matter, ladies and gentlemen. Our motives matter. 
We should do things. We should not just do the things God tells us to do, but we should do the things God tells us to do in the manner in, that he tells us to do them. And so this conflict breaks out. Verse 9, the Philistines come up and encamp in Judah and made a raid on Lehi. And the men of Judah said, why have you come up against us? And they said, we have come up to bind Samson and to, and to do to him as he did to us. And then, so this is the, the Philistines are, hey, give us Samson. We want Samson. We want, we want, we want Samson. And then 3,000 men of Judah, this is team Samson. This is his own kinsmen. This is his own nation. 3,000 men sell him out. And went, they went down to the cleft of the rock at Edom and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? Which, which I would respond Do you not know God wants to deliver you from the oppressive hand of the Philistines? But nonetheless, they didn't go there. What then is this that you have done to us? And he said to them, They did, as they did to me, I have done to them. See this whole this whole thing, both the Philistines and Samson, they're following the same cultural cue of, hey, you harmed me, I got to harm you. You fight me, I fight you. And in verse 12, and they said to him, we have come down to bind you and to give you into the hands of the Philistines. And Samson said to them, swear to me that you will not attack me yourselves. And they said to him, no, we will only bind you. Ah, we'll just arrest you and give you into their hands. We will surely not kill you cool friends, like, we're not going to kill you, Samson, but we are going to turn you over to the oppressive ruling government that hates you. Why? Why are you going to do this, Samson? Why are you going to do this? Well, because we're scared of them. We don't trust God. God is not coming to our defense. I know you think that, you know, God's raised you up to deliver us, but really you're just causing problems. So if we can just get rid of you, you're causing problems for us culturally. Kind of like the Jews later will get rid of Jesus because he's causing a lot of problems for them. You know, uh, we, we just don't, we just want to keep the peace. See, here's the a, here's a thing about God's people. We should desire peace as, as, as long as it's possible. But peace as a priority is not the call of the Christian. Obedience to God is the priority. Glorifying God is the priority. So if there's a moment in which you must stand against the oppressive ruler or governing authority, it is to do the will of God, to obey the king of the universe, Jesus Christ. So what we have here is God's people, 3,000 armed men of God's people go down to, to arrest Samson and hand him over to their oppressors because they don't like the conflict that's getting stirred up. Hey, just keep the peace. You know, let, they're going to let us kind of continue to do commerce here. We don't really have to worship the God of the Bible. We can worship their gods. Our, it, it just doesn't really matter. Syncretism has blended into their nation. Uh, corruption has blend, blended into their nation. And what is happening is that now God's people, they can't eat, they, 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 they're, they're cowering to the cultural uh, agreements of the state that is, is, that is legislating and putting upon the people of God to hinder the work of God. And now they're selling out the, faithful, the one faithful guy to the, the mission, Samson. I promise you it will happen in our day. If, if, if there's more oppress, uh, oppression to God's people than there currently is, and, and, and if there, there could be more, I promise you there's going to be a, a type of Christian, maybe 3,000 of them, that would gather together and rather sell out God's people for obedience to Jesus just to keep the peace. This is why we must be, re, be reminded, Christians, the goal is not peace. The goal is the glory of God. That's our pursuit. And Jesus Christ himself says, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. When God's word, will, and ways invades a culture, and he seeks by his word and his will and his ways to change it inside out, redeem it, transform it, renew it, friction happens. Friction happens. And the peace that will come on the other side must first go through a test, through a fire. So they bind Samson. They bound him with two new ropes as opposed to the old ropes because, you know, he needed the, they needed stronger ropes and brought him up from the rock. 
Samson has a plan. All right, bind me. Don't kill me. He said, don't attack me. Because he knows, I'm about to slaughter them. If you all start fighting for the other team, I'm going to kill you too. This is why Samson's really warning them, hey, you're not going to fight against me, just bound me? Okay, cool. That's cool. I have another plan. His plan involves uh, a donkey, a jawbone. So this is what we're going to see. Verse 14. And when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. So God, the Holy Spirit, empowers him. And the ropes that were on his arms become as flax uh, that caught fire. And his, and, and his bonds melted off his hands. He just busts the, the ropes off of his hands. And he found a fresh, keyword, fresh jawbone of a donkey and put it in his hand. And with it, he struck 1,000 men. Why is it important that it's fresh? Well, because it's not brittle. This is, what it, this is the point here. This donkey has just died, maybe got been eaten by uh, some, some lions. It's a fresh kill, meaning the bone is, still has as power. And, and it's, it's not brittle, as strength to it. So he takes, it's still a crazy feat to destroy, you know, a, a, a whole army with, with just the jawbone of a donkey. But the point is, that's what he has. He has this fresh jawbone of a donkey. He, he, he slaughters a thousand men, gets this great victory, and Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, and with the jawbone of a donkey, I've struck down a thousand men. He's celebrating. He's got a victory. The question you and I need to be asking is, why does the Nazarite choose to pick up a donkey jawbone as his weapon? He could have picked up a stick. It didn't matter. Like clearly it wasn't the jawbone that was like the, oh man, I have really good skills with jawbones. Like I'm really, really good at jawbones. That's like my only weapon I can use. That's not. See, Samson again doesn't care about his vow to God. So he sees the, the dead carcass. I'll use that. It doesn't matter. As long as I complete the mission. I need you to see that sometimes Christians, we do this, doesn't matter what, doesn't matter how I do it, as long as I do, as long as at the end of the goal, we make disciples. It doesn't matter if we manipulate people, it doesn't matter if we abuse people, it doesn't matter if we, we uh, run over people, it doesn't matter if we do this, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. As long as we accomplish the goal, it does matter. It does matter. And in this moment, it's almost as if Samson finally realizes it matters. He's just done this crazy, crazy, miraculous feat. The Spirit of the Lord empowered him to strike down a thousand men all by himself with the jawbone of a donkey. And he finished speaking and he threw away the jawbone from his hand. It's almost as if he realizes he's celebrating in victory. I just, yes, we won. And he looks up and he's like, I'm a Nazarite. <laughs> woo Get that away from me. You know, you're not your Libre fans. He got the corn out of his face. It's this moment where it's like he realizes, man, I shouldn't be messing around with this. What we begin to see starting at this point is that Samson is finally starting to pay attention to the will of God. Finally starting to pay attention to what he's supposed to be doing. He's finally starting to look not just to his own ways, but to God's ways. And so in this great victory, he throw, throws away the jawbone, and that place was called uh, Ramoth Lehi, which means hill of the jawbone or jawbone hill, commemorating, remembering this moment where Samson gets this great victory. Next, what we move into is Samson's relationship with God. So as he's throwing this jawbone away, he's realizing, son, son, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Why do I have this jawbone in my hand? I'm a Nazarite, and he throws it away. Next, in verse 18, he says, and he was very thirsty, and he called upon the Lord. I want us to see this connection here. As he's reminded, he's reminded of his sin, his foolishness, his folly, the fact that he's not supposed to have a jawbone in his hand or be around anything unclean, he realizes it and he throws it away and he immediately cries out to the Lord. And I want you to think about you and your life. Samson has been over and over and over and over again doing what he feels is right in his own eyes and he's, he's only always seeming to do foolish things. 
And it's almost as if he realizes it in this moment, like, I blew it again. I blew it again. Any of you ever been there? You're like, I'm just tired of getting so angry all the time. I keep blowing it with my anger. I keep blowing it with my lust. I keep blowing it with my pride. I just keep, I just keep all over and over and over again. I just find myself in these same situations, and, and I'm, just, I'm just tired of it. And you're just, you want to just throw it away. Like Samson throws the jawbone of the donkey away from him. And what we see is that he now he throws the jawbone away and then he draws near to the Lord. What is it in your life you need to throw away and then your next step, draw near to the Lord? If this is you, you're like, I want to draw near the Lord. Let me show you. Let's see how Samson imperfectly draw near, draws near to the Lord. May this be an encouragement to you because sometimes we feel like we have to clean ourselves up before we can come to the Lord. We feel like we have to, to get our prayers right. We have to go to church uh, X number of times in the month to make sure that our prayers get to heaven. Like we do some weird, we think weird stuff as Christians. If I can just figure some stuff out, then God will love me again. That's not true. That's not the gospel. We are imperfect. God is perfect. And watch how God deals with this imperfect man, Samson, who's been, quite frankly, willfully rebelling against God for quite some time. And he's coming to this realization in this, this moment of what looks like repentance, throws this jawbone away, and it says he was very thirsty and he called upon the Lord. Important for us to see. He calls upon the Lord. He's, he's praying to God. And what, is his, what was his prayer like? And he said, you have granted this salvation by the hand of your servant. It's the first thing he says. I'm going to get into the whole thing. First thing he says, he recognized that God saves. Then he says, and now I shall die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised. This is Samson first acknowledging God's strength and second complaining. It's very imperfect prayer. I just want this to encourage you. Your prayers don't have to be perfect. They just need to be honest. What Samson does first is he acknowledges that it is God who's given him strength and it is God who is his salvation. The text that we read is clear that the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Samson and gives him his strength. Samson here, through his prayer, we see he knows that too. He knows that it's not his, his will. He knows that it's not his power. He knows that it's not his ways. He knows that it's God that's, that's giving him this strength. It's God who delivered him from the hands of the Philistines. It's God who worked a miracle with the jawbone. He's, he's, he's recognizing it. That's the first thing. He, he's not going, man, I'm a, thank you, God, because I'm a really good fighter. Because he is. He's still a really good fighter. But thank you, God, you did something. You showed up. You are the Lord of salvation. You, you granted this great salvation by your, uh, the hand of your servant. I'm your servant. I serve you, Jesus. I follow you, Jesus. I'm yours. I'm, I'm a servant of you. What we see here is that the glory rightly belongs to the Lord for this great victory. And Samson acknowledges it. He says, God, it's your victory. And so throughout the story of Samson, what we see is God is actually working behind the scenes to de bring deliverance to his people. And so this is what I want you to see here, that, that Samson is clear that Samson is not the hero. He's, not, he's, he's being honest about it. He said, God, you are the one who granted salvation. This is, comes after this moment of this jawbone where he's celebrating kind of proud with this victory. And he's like, ah, I'm the man. I got this jawbone. We got the victory. He immediately throws it aside. He goes, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm dying of thirst. God, you gave us the victory. I, I, I'm coming to you in, in, in sort of a, a posture of repentance. And he says, you have granted this salvation. God, you are my strength. You are my salvation. The glory rightly belongs to you, Lord. You're the hero. I'm not the hero. And this is happening amidst the culture where they have forsaken God completely. And so what I want you to see here is that this act of grace and miraculous power that God has given Samson to deliver uh, in this moment uh, his, him from the hand of the Philistines here, is, it comes from a God who loves not just Samson, but loves his people. He loves his people. He has seen their oppression. He has sought to deliver them himself. That's what 
God's people up to this point, judges uh, and judges uh, with the, with the story of Samson, they don't cry out in repentance. They don't they don't pray to God asking for His help. They're they're completely hell bent on their own destruction. They don't care about God's word, will, and ways. And then God steps in, shows up, uses this 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 wild, crazy, selfish, egomaniac, impulsive Samson to do so because he loves them. They may not love him, but he loves them. They don't want God's best for them. Uh, they only want to do what's right in their own eyes. But God loves them. He has his, the best for them, and he's going to pursue them. His ways for them are good. They're, they're to, for wholeness, not for harm. He wants to give them truly a, a true hope, a legacy, a future. Though they don't care about those things, God still does. And if that's you today, and you've just wandered from God, and you're continuing, you're not even sure if you want to turn back, and you're, and you're just running, running, running from him. The God who pursues his people in the book of Judges, when they don't ask for him to pursue them, is pursuing you through the person in the work of Jesus. This is what we see here. The story behind the story here that we're reading is that God loves his people. God loves his people. And his ways are for their good and flourishing. And though they don't believe that, though they've rejected him, though they're running from him, he's running to them. And what we see here is it's marked, this, this, this moment, this great battle, this great victory is marked by this, this term that means the hill of the jawbone or jawbone hill. They commemorate and they remember this, this great victory where God raised up Samson to deliver his people from the hands of the Philistines. They called it uh, Jawbone Hill. This is the remembering the great salvation we see here, the great salvation that God has granted Samson. That's their, their token of remembrance. Christian, your remembrance that God loves you and he's pursuing you was also happened and commemorated on a hill. It was not the hill uh, of the jawbone, but it was the hill of the skull, Golgotha, where Jesus dies in your place for your sins. He takes on the, the, the weight of, of our guilt and our shame for eternity. And where God in, raises up Samson to deliver his people here from the hands of their oppressor, Jesus was raised up to deliver us from our greatest oppressor, oppressor the sin in our own heart. To deliver us from our enslavement to sin. To provide, just like he did with Samson, a great salvation. A great salvation. And so the first thing we do as Christians is in, in, in our relationship with God is we should honor, we should, we should turn to, and we should remember in God's great salvation. God's great salvation. Next, what we see is the pity party. <laughs> Samson, now I shall die of thirst. God, you're really good. You're really God. You're, mag you're miraculous. You saved me from the hands of the Philistines. Now what are you going to do? Just let me die? Like, he's, 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 his, his heart is full of complaining now. Some scholars would say that he's actually maybe really, really, really exhausted, which likely so, uh, but he's maybe at heat exhaustion. Maybe he feels like he's actually going to die and he needs water. True statement. But he is kind of complaining. You know how we know this? Because he's like, God, you're really good. You're really awesome. You know, you're great salvation. Now I'm just going to die of thirst and you're going to let me die by the hand of these uncircumcised Philistines? See, he has a complaining spirit here. This often happens uh, 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 when there's a great victory in your life. Usually it's followed by a great low. Uh, um, so oftentimes it can be from what is called an adrenal dump. So you, your adrenaline will be, be rushing. You'll accomplish something great. And then after the fact, you're really exhausted and tired. I'll just personally say this. Mondays, I feel the lowest of the low in the week. I feel exhausted. But after Sunday, after preaching two services, I feel quite exhausted. One o'clock, three o'clock, if I not, have not had a nap, then I feel like Samson and throwing a pity party. I do. And so there are other complainers in the Bible. Uh, Elijah was one of those as well. Elijah, he was used by God to call down fire from heaven, miracle, and then to destroy all the, 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 uh, the, the, the false gods, and then the next scene, he starts crying because a woman wants to kill him. 
It's like, bro, you just slaughtered everybody, and now you, you, you wanna, you're scared of the woman. And, and what God does for Elijah in that moment is he gives him food, he gives him water, and he gives him a nap. The Holy Trinity of nourishment. This is my like, this is my go-to. If I'm feeling this way, give me some food, give me some water, and give me a, give me a nap. You and I are experiencing these moments too. What we see here with Samson is that he's in this low moment and God is gracious towards him. He loves him. So what does he do? God refreshes him and restores him by another miracle, by giving him water out of the ground. He makes a spring of water burst forth. And we see here in verse 9, And God split open the hollow place that is at uh, Lehi, and the water came out of it. And he drank, and his spirit returned, and he was revived. And therefore, the name is called uh, in Hackery. It is at Lehi to this day. And he, meaning Samson, judged Israel in the days of the Philistine 20 years. God sees Samson in the lowest of lows. Samson cries out to the Lord. God refreshes and restores him. What I want you to see here is, is not, not, the, the, the mess, not just the messiness and imperfection of Samson's life. I want you to see where he goes at this point in this juncture of the story. In the moment of repentance, laying down the jawbone, in the moment of, 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 of weariness and exhaustion, he doesn't turn to vices. He turns to God. He's like, I need refreshment. I need renewal. I need revival. I need to complain. He turns to God. Let me encourage you. Whenever you have a, a desire to complain, don't complain to your friends. Don't complain to your spouse. Don't complain to me. Complain to the Lord. Complain to the Lord. He can handle it. Your spouse likely can't really actually handle it, though you, she he or she thinks they can. Uh, it just leads to bitterness in their own heart against the, whoever you're complaining about. Uh, moreover, uh, the, your friends can't also handle it. Your God can. Complain to the Lord. You ever feel like throwing a pity party? Throw a pity party to the Lord and let God refresh and restore you. Sometimes he does so like he does. Uh, Samson gives him water and rest. Sometimes he, he encourages us by giving us food, water, and a nap like Elijah. Or he does like Peter. The apostle Peter, when Jesus, when he was complaining to Jesus, and he says, hey, we just lost the rich young ruler. He's not on our team anymore. He was going to finance the mission. He was going to do it all. And, and we needed him, Jesus. We've left everything. What are we to do, Jesus? And he look, Jesus looks at Peter. He doesn't give him a nap or food or water, but he does give him a reminder. He reminds him that in the kingdom, Jesus' team, that when you leave houses, mothers, brothers, sisters, whenever you sacrifice for God's sake and the kingdom's sake, you inherit a hundredfold in this life and in the life to come. That's what Jesus tells Peter when he's complaining. The point I want you to see is that we're to, in these moments of, of, of where we feel like we're exhausted, we want to throw a pity party, do so. Just run to the Lord. Let him refresh you. Let him revive you. Let him restore you. And what we see here with Samson is though he may have this fickle relationship with, with God, he at least runs to him in his moment of need. He acknowledges who God is. He acknowledges his provision. He acknowledges salvation. He acknowledges his strength. Yes, he complains to the Lord, and he he's, he's, he's kind of makes himself look very foolish, but he's honest and raw to the Lord in prayer. And what God does, he graciously steps in, provides water through a miracle, and restores Samson. This reminds me of the things one of the things Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Give to us our daily bread. Something so simple. But in order to pray for that, you have to be humble. How many of you actually pray for daily bread? I mean, I'll pray for my food, but you know, I kind of forget to pray for just having it. Most of us do. Probably Samson doesn't pray for water very often <laughs> until he needs it. Samson in this moment of emotional train wreck, needs restoration, so he turns to the Lord. Let me ask you, when you're in an emotional train wreck, where do you run? Who do you turn to? Who do you turn to? 
Samson runs to the Lord. Though he may act like a melodramatic child, complaining in this moment, he's at least running as a child to his father. God the Father, who loves him, restores him, forgives him, nourishes him, provides for him. This is what a relationship with God looks like. Do you acknowledge who God is? His strength, his power, his salvation. Do you run to him for your needs, even your basic needs, especially your basic needs? When you, when you need restoration, when you need strength, are you, do you have the type of relation where you run to God to be restored? Last week I said that uh, the first of the 90, uh, uh, 95 theses of Martin Luther was all, the, all of the Christian life is a one of repentance. Repentance literally means just turning around. I'll say it another way this week. Uh, all of the Christian life is an invitation to Jesus to turn around and run to him. All of your life, all of your life is an invitation to Jesus. The good days, run to Jesus. Everything's going great. Invitation. You open it up in the mail. Jesus wants to see you. Things are going great. Go celebrate with him. Be glad with him. Celebrate the goodness of God. In the good days, run to Jesus. It's an invitation. Bad days, invitation to Jesus. When you're in a season of abundance, Run to Jesus. It's an invitation to Jesus. When you're in a season of lack, it's an invitation to Jesus. When you're having an emotional high or an emotional low, both are invitations to the Lord Jesus to run to him. Even your sin, when you are aware of your sin and full of shame, run to Jesus. It's an invitation to Jesus. Your victory over sin, invitation to Jesus. Your entire life is an invitation to Jesus. Don't compartmentalize your life. Every part of your life is meant to see as an invitation to the Lord Jesus to bring your entire life to him. Process your pain with Jesus. Process your complaints with Jesus. Process everything with Jesus and let him restore your soul. When, when, when Samson did this, it said he drank this water that the Lord provided. His spirit returned and he revived. And therefore, the name of, uh, of that place is called in uh, Hackery, which means, which actually means the spring of the caller or the one who calls. What Samson is doing is setting apart this, this, this spring, commemorating it, remembering it uh, for the great miraculous supply of water that God provided for him when he was exhausted, burnt out, tired, and in need. The Lord God, the God of, uh, in Hackery, still supplies our needs. He's still alive and well. Samson felt like he was dying of thirst and you, for you, it may not be dying of thirst. You may feel like, you know, my finances, my health, my family, my friendships, my foolishness, my folly, my own shortcomings. I just feel pinned up in a corner and I can't move and I feel trapped. I'm exhausted and I can't move forward. Turn to the Lord God who supplied supernaturally Samson's needs. Run to him. It's an invitation to him to be refreshed, to be restored, to be renewed. The same thing God did for Samson, he can do for you. Run to him. Run to him. Samson then, after this, sets apart the spring in remembrance of, the God, uh, of God and what he has done. What we're about to do is partake in another remembrance of what God has done. We're going to remember the death, burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus through the eating of the bread and the drinking of the cup through communion. And in doing so, we get to remember, remind our souls, Jesus Christ loves us. Jesus Christ has given himself for us. Jesus Christ has supplied all of our needs. Jesus Christ wants us to run to him. So may you run to him, remembering that Jesus is the source of all life. And as you eat and as you drink today, may you be revived. May you be restored. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for being our great salvation and our strength. May we be the type of people who run to you, who process our pain with you, who, who share our complaints with you, who run to you and get changed by you. Change us, transform us, revive us. Where we need to be revived and refreshed and restored today, would you do so now as we respond, as we remember, as we celebrate your great sacrifice on our behalf, Lord. Do something mighty among us. Heal us where we need healing. Encourage us where we need encouragement. Nourish us, refresh us, revive our soul. In Christ's name, amen.